While U.S. forces in the Pacific were leapfrogging islands thousands of miles to the west, Allied forces in Europe were preparing to embark on the most ambitious amphibious invasion in the history of warfare, the invasion of German-held France. Historian Craig Simons captured this in his marvelous Naval Institute Historical Atlas of the U.S. Navy. The overall European operation would be Operation Overlord. The naval and amphibious part would be Operation Neptune. General Dwight D. Eisenhower headed the overall Operation Overlord. Operation Neptune would last from 6 to 24 June, and more than 700,000 troops, more than 1,000 vehicles, and ton after ton after ton of supplies would go ashore in Normandy, with paratroopers jumping in behind German lines in the pre-dawn, and with U.S. and British battleships, cruisers, and destroyers providing gunfire support, U.S. and British and Canadian troops would go ashore. The U.S. at Omaha and Utah beaches, the British and Canadians at Juno, Sword, and Gold. For more than a year, the Allies had been working on elaborate deception plans to keep the Germans from knowing where they planned to land. The Germans knew they would need port facilities. They probably thought the landing would be at Calais or Cherbourg. The Allies chose Normandy. In later years, President Eisenhower, in his biography, Crusade in Europe, would write, for centuries it had been known that the beaches of Normandy were famous for storms the year round. And if you're gonna land, you need to be able to put supplies and maintenance ashore. You need a harbor. We decided to build artificial harbors in Normandy. At the time this planning was taking place, Navy Reserve Commander Edmund J. Moran in Washington was being bombarded with secret questions by staff members of then Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Ernest J. King. They wanted to know about ground tackle, about putting gear ashore, about landing ashore. Moran was a tugboat man. He was climbing through the ranks of his family's Moran Towing Company based in New York. And in fact, he would rise to become chairman and president of the company. At the same time, he would become a Navy Rear Admiral. His grandfather, Michael Moran, had immigrated to the United States and founded Moran Towing in 1860. As an Irish immigrant, he had had his first work driving mules on the Erie Canal. Now, his grandson, Edmund was an expert in tugboat operations, in safety operations, in rescue operations, in shallow water operations, and he was being drawn into some highly secret new planning. Admiral Howard Stark, the commander of U.S. Naval Forces in Europe, invited him over to London. He said, I've got a plan that we're considering. I want you to take a look at it. The next thing Moran knew, the Army had questions for him. They wanted to know what craft the Navy had that could put troops ashore, that could rise up onto the beach in shallow water operations, disembark troops and gear, and then depart. And Moran told them there were no such craft in the Navy at that time. Fast forward a bit. Now in England, Moran was reviewing the planning already underway for the artificial harbors. There would be two parts to the artificial harbors. Outer breakwaters made up of freighters sunk bow to stern to form breakwaters and then inner piers to get the gear from the ships coming from England ashore on the beaches in France. And these would be codenamed mulberries. At the time that this was being done, British shipyards were packed with work and they had no, no space to do more building. And so giant holes were dug on the banks of the Thames River Big excavators carved enormous holes, and the caissons for the mulberry ship to shore piers were built. They were enormous. They would be 7,000 tons when loaded. They would be more than 200 feet long, 70 feet wide, draft of 23 feet. And when they finished building these concrete caissons on the banks of the Thames, the outer earth was removed and they were floated out into the Thames River and taken to ports. While this was going on, Moran was carrying out a number of assignments for Admiral Stark. At the same time, professionally 
and personally, he was concerned, worried that the tugs and their crews might not be well enough prepared to embark on the enormous towing of the caissons across the English Channel. He went aboard a number of tugs, talked to the crews, talked to the skippers. He talked to the British officer in charge of the towing operations. And after those conversations, that British officer told his superiors, this guy can do the job much better than I can do it. Put him in charge. U.S. and British flags conferred, and Moran, now Captain Moran, was in charge of a tug fleet some 150 ships strong. He selected a Dutch tug to be the lead tug. He figured, these guys have had their country overrun. They'll have the right spirit for this sort of operation. He selected an American tug for the second boat. He said the skipper was a game sort of guy. The D-Day assault took place early, early on 6 June. And in the middle of the night, as they were departing England to embark on the assault, Moran put a letter into the mail to his wife, Alice. My dear Alice, on this very great night, in the midst of such an important event in the history of the world, I send you all of my love, Edmund. The tugs towed at five to six knots, and when they neared the shores of France, they were joined by armed escorts to protect them against enemy fire. The entire operation went entirely according to plan. When the caissons were at the selected sites, they were taken over by U.S. and British engineers and Navy Seabees and sunk into place. And then the piers were built from those caissons with the ramps going to the beach. Thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of ammunition, fuel, and supplies would go ashore. Hundreds of thousands of vehicles would go ashore. The U.S. Mulberry was at Omaha. The British Mulberry was at Gold. And in late June, a severe storm would damage the U.S. Mulberry beyond repair. But it had already done its part in the Normandy landing. The British Mulberry at Gold was partly protected by a rock coastal outcropping, and it would serve as an artificial harbor for many months to come. Moran, now back in England, suddenly received orders to report aboard the destroyer USS Thompson down in Portsmouth. He said aye aye and went down to Portsmouth and at 5 a.m. he was having breakfast in the wardroom of the destroyer when another guy sat down beside him and said, can anyone get anything to eat here? It was Eisenhower. Eisenhower was there at the time because the Thompson, just days before, had taken him and General Arnold and General George Marshall and Admiral Ernest King over to look at the invasion beaches. Ike, now on the destroyer with Moran alone, told him he was gravely worried about not having enough supplies to continue the invasion. He said, I'm going to send you back to the United States on a mission. I'm going to have you go at the highest levels to the right people and tell them what I need and there will be nothing in writing. Moran said, aye, aye. And as he was preparing to leave the Thompson, he ran in to General Marshall and Admiral King. And King said, hey, I saw that place you built in Normandy, and I must say you did a great job. Years later, Moran would try to play down his D-Day role, but he had been awarded U.S. decorations, French decorations, British decorations. He had played a unique and valuable role. This episode has been brought to you by the members of the U.S. Naval Institute. For more, go to usni.org slash join.